chapter 4. We're going to be picking up with verse 8 today. But again, for context, as I want to remind you again that Galatians is divided into three sections. The first two chapters being Paul's personal defense of justification by faith as he's talking about first from his experience and defending his apostleship. It's, you know, his experience with the Lord and how the Lord's worked in his life. And then he carries that over to the Galatians talking about, you know, remember how the Lord's already worked in your lives as well. Then in chapters 3 through 4, it's his biblical or theological defense of justification by faith. And then in 5 and 6, it's a practical or applicational defense of justification by faith. Now, to just kind of review the section that we're in as well, in chapter 3, verses 1 through 9, he gave a definition of justification. Uh, some people have described it as being, you know, being made just as if I'd never sinned. It's to be declared righteous. And then in verses 10 through 14, we see that Jesus redeemed us as well from the curse of the law. And then in verses 15 through 25, that there's a difference between, you know, as he covered with Abraham, there's a difference between the promise that was made and then the law that was given after that, not negating the promise that was made. And that promise is the promise that he made to Abraham of justification by faith. And then... Last week, we looked at verses 23, 26 through 4, 7, what it means to be a son and an heir. Heir, heir, not an error, an heir. But now, in looking at this section, verses 8 to 20, we're going to see three important things because what Paul's doing at this point, he's been taking us through there and, and as I said, we've gone through this section from three to four, still in the middle of it. There's another part of it next week. We'll look at it. But in the middle of this sort of, he's pausing and he's really sharing his heart. He's sharing a pastor's heart of what his concern for them is. And we see three things here. The first thing in verses 8 through 11 is that his desire for them to stay away from vain religion. And then in verses 12 through 16, they're to remember how God has worked in their lives, as we are as well. Always should always remember how God's worked in our lives. And then... In verses 17 through 20, he, his exhortation to them is that Christ might be formed in you. So, going back uh, now to verse, beginning with verse 8, we look at his exhortation to them to stay away from vain religion. As in verse 8, he says, in the past you didn't know God, as the verse reads, but then indeed, when you did not know God, you served those which by nature are not gods. Paul is reminding the Galatians that this was their real past experience. They were in a state in which they didn't know God in the sense that they did not recognize him for who he is. There are people today who believe in God, but they don't recognize him for who he is, the sovereign ruler of the universe, who his standards are the ones we follow, not making up our own like sparkle creeds. If you haven't heard that this week, it was the, this, you know, where there was a declaration that God's non-binary, and Jesus had two fathers, and all of this stuff, and it's basically making it up to justify a lifestyle. 
but it's out of ignorance, not knowing God for who he is. You see, when we talk about vain religion, we're not just talking about paganism. And Paul's not just talking about that. He's comparing these two things really in with the Galatians. One is, yeah, vain religion is to worship things that aren't God. Two, it's to worship God, the true God, in vain ways. Uh, it, like all of the, every other religious system other than biblical Christianity is a works-based religious system. It's all what you have to do to earn position with God. And it's that way in every pagan system. Going back to the law for them is really like, he compares it to really like going back to the same thing. Because they're again trying to be justified by works. But he's saying to him, to them here, when you were in that condition before, you know, worshiping things that aren't God, you put yourself in bondage to things that really weren't God. They worshiped Bacchus, who is the god of drink, Aphrodite, who is the goddess of sexual love, Athena, the goddess of wisdom and intellect, Gaia, the goddess of the earth, Hera, goddess of marriage. I like this one. Hypnos, the god of sleep. But when you think about it, they worship these gods that weren't really gods, but what they were worshiping really was those things. And people do the same thing today. We just aren't intellectually honest enough to say that we're really worshiping these things. It's like people will worship, you know, people who live for their parties on the weekends. They're worshiping Bacchus. People who worship sex, they're worshiping um, Aphrodite. People who worship their intellect are worshiping Athena. People these days are worshiping the earth. They're worshiping Gaia. Now, the important point here is to realize there's even, there's good things in this. Like, there's nothing wrong with marriage, but they have here Hera, the uh, goddess of marriage, but it's to the point that they're elevating marriage itself to a place above God. It's where it's like with hypnos. They're worshiping sleep. I got to get my I got to get my 8 hours. For me it's 7. It's like if I I go to bed and it's like clockwork. I'll wake up 7 hours after I go to almost to the minute after I go to sleep, if I have the time to get it enough. But I don't go around saying, oh, I have to have my seven hours. Don't schedule anything. Nobody call me. Nobody interrupt me. Don't, don't tap me on the shoulder. Don't do anything for those seven hours. That would be worshiping sleep. And that's the kind of thing they were doing. They were worshiping those areas of their lives rather than worshiping and recognizing the God who was sovereign over all those areas. That's why Paul, in Acts chapter 17, when he was at Athens, walking through the Areopagus there where they had all of the idols around, and he saw one altar to the unknown God, he, he, then he declared to the Athenians there, he said, I see you guys are really religious. You got all these statues all over the place. You're worshiping. You're really religious. Now, that wasn't necessarily a, po necessarily a positive thing to say to them, but saying, yeah, I see you bow down to a lot of stuff. Then he said, but you know this altar you have here to the unknown God? He used that as an opportunity to say, what you worship in ignorance, I declare to you openly. The God who made all this stuff. He's not worshipped by men's hands. He's not worshipped. He doesn't need us to feed him. He doesn't need any. In him we live, we move, we have our being. He's over it all. 
But the point being, in what he's saying to them then, and the question we need to ask ourselves is, because really because what we worship is what the master passion of our lives is. What is that thing that gets us up in the morning? What is that thing that drives us to do what we do throughout the day? What is the master passion of your life? And if it's anything other than the Lord, you're worshiping an idol. There's some sort of, there's something you've let encroach in your life, in your walks with the Lord, that's distracting you. And that's what Paul is warning them against. Saying this is what they were doing in the past. Now, in verses 9 through 10, he, said, he basically says to him, after being in a relationship with God, it makes no sense to go back to cheap substitutes. As it reads in verse 9 and 10, but now after you have known God or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to weak and beggarly elements to which you desire again to be in bondage. You observe days and months and seasons and years. Excuse me. Paul was blown away by the fact that the Galatians could come to know God and still turn back to another workspace system. Yeah, before they were in paganism. But now they came, he came and preached the gospel to them then these other folks come in, tell them something different, and all of a sudden they're going back to a workspace system. This time the Jewish law rather than paganism but still being a workspace system. The word used here for knowing God in Greek means to know him by experience. It's, a, it's saying you're coming into a relationship with him. And it's like the fact that you can read a lot about doing something, but until you do it, you really don't know it. You can read a lot about God, but you really don't know him until you've yielded your life to him and you're walking with him in a relationship. But what is critically important, as Paul shares with him, isn't just that you know him, but that he knows you. As it says in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, not everyone who says to be Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will come to me in that day, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You know, it's no big deal to know a celebrity. Everybody knows a celebrity. We see him on TV. Well, see him in movies, even in the quote unquote Christian world. You know, you know, you watch these different YouTubers and they become famous through YouTube. Knowing them is no big deal. But comparatively, it's a bigger deal if they know you. And even more so when it comes to knowing the Lord. As we also read in the scripture, it says, you know, you believe God is one? Great. Well, the demons also believe that and tremble. It's not enough to just 
intellectually assent to something. It's not enough to just know information about God. It's utterly necessary and vital that you have a relationship with him through Jesus Christ. That's the point. He goes on to say, you know, and when Paul speaks of the things that the Galatians are returning to, he describes them as weak and beggarly elements, referring back to verse 3 where he said, even so when, or even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. These guys had not been Jewish before, but pagan idol worshipers, Paul saw turning to the law as the same thing as returning to paganism because they're both worth works-based religious systems. They were going back to the same sort of system. For me, it's a tragedy anytime I hear that somebody who's come to know the Lord, and they're going to a Bible-believing, Bible-teaching church to hear that they then turn and go to some liturgical workspace church. It's like, why? Why? You had a problem with relationship? You had a problem with... You see, I think some people, honestly, I think some people struggle with the responsibility of it in the sense that you're responsible for your relationship with the Lord. There's nobody telling you in the sense, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. I'm just saying, you got to walk with the Lord. And not just, not to, oh, you have to offer this sacrifice, you have to do this, you know. And people can go through and check off their list and think, I'm good with God. Now, in verse 11, he goes on to say, but he says, I am afraid for you lest I have labored for you in vain. Paul had a serious concern for the Galatians. He was wanting to, they were wanting to go back to the elementary principles of the world. And so, in Paul's mind, this called into question the relationship with the Lord. As it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 2, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you, which you received, and in which you stand, by which you also are saved, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Also in Philippians 2, 14 through 16, do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and a perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Also in 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, for this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. Also, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 13, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. The point of these passages seems to be that the kind of faith that saves endures. You can have assurance and you should have assurance of your salvation to be confident in your standing with the Lord. That's why John wrote the First, he wrote First John for that purpose, that they might have assurance of their salvation. 
you can be saved and know that you're saved. But Paul's saying to the Galatians, if you weren't really sincere here, all of this intense labor I've done in coming to, as I came to you, as I denied myself, put my life on the line, he's saying all of this was in vain if you really didn't believe. And now in verses 12 through 16, he's telling them to remember how God has worked in your life. As he says in verse 12, Brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. Paul didn't claim to be perfect, but he wanted the Galatians to follow his example. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, he says, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Do you see what he's doing? He's encouraging them. He's challenging them in their relationship with the Lord. He's kind of trying to give them a kickstart here as he's saying, you know, if you need an example of what it means to walk with the Lord, to have a relationship with the Lord, look at me. Look at what I do, the focus of my life, the priorities of my life. Look at me and follow me as I follow Christ. And as you do that, you will begin to look beyond me and look to Christ. That's what his desire was for them. And as we'll see in the next section beyond this is that his desire is for Christ to be formed in them, for them to be walking with the Lord and fellowship with the Lord. He wanted them to imitate his consistency the consistency of his trust in the finished work. He wanted them to imitate the liberty that he had in Christ. He wanted them to imitate his simplicity in following Jesus. Now, when Paul came to Galatia, he felt free to be like them, in that he felt free to become like a Gentile in 1 Corinthians 9, 19 through 23, he talks about becoming all things to all men that by all means he might win some. So willing to compromise on the non-essential issues. He ate with them. You know, he did those things that, are, that weren't sinful. He did the things that were cultural in order that he might gain a hearing, that he might see that even in the midst of their own cultures, they can walk with Jesus. He wasn't taking things personally and speaking out of a sense of personal hurt as they might have thought, but he was just speaking out of his concern for them. He was speaking as a pastor concerned about their relationship with Jesus. And that's the heart of a pastor. When you think about the weight, the, the challenge that a pastor has, you know, there's that um, scripture and James, not let many of you be teachers because you'll incur stricter judgment, strict, stricter condemnation even if you teach off, if you mislead people. You had his, Paul's challenge as well to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20 to shepherd the flock of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The seriousness of the ministry. And then, of course, in John 
chapter 21, you have his challenge to Peter. Peter, if you love me, feed my sheep. And so Paul had, the, his heart was burdened for these guys, not seeing their walking, not seeing where they were at with the Lord and not, you know, his concern, his serious concern for them. And that's a concern of any real pastor. Isn't to get the church real big. It isn't to, you know, be able to write books and do all this stuff and become a popular speaker. It's to know that the people in the congregation for which he is responsible, that they're walking with the Lord, that he's seeing Jesus formed in them. Because that's the goal. That's the goal. In verses 13 through 15, he talks about, tells them to remember how God has blessed. As he, as he says, you know that because of physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first. And my trial which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Now, Paul here is speaking of is what we believe is speaking of is the thorn in the flesh that he talks about in uh, Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Some believe that he contracted a form of malaria when he came into southern Galatia, which was, again, Turkey. It's the middle section of modern-day Turkey. There's a city there named Perga in the area of Pamphylia, low-lying area, a lot of marshes around, a lot of mosquitoes. They had a form of malaria there that really affected the eyes. And according to the commentator William Barclay, it created such a great pain that it was like having a red-hot bar thrust through your forehead. On the other hand, some believe that he had a condition, a disease named ophthalmia, which is a condition caused by being in an environment with a lot of smoke from like campfires and oil lanterns and you remember when he was in the upper room in that one house where he was sharing overnight, and I believe it was Miletus, I'm not positive, but he's sharing, and there's a guy named Eutychus in the window, and because of all of the lanterns, it was, you know, basically using up the oxygen in that room, and it was getting filled with smoke. Eutychus passes out and falls out the window. Well, the, the, all of that smoke, being around all that smoke all of the time because, you know, of their stage and technology that they were, limited place, having all that smoke constantly in his eyes might have caused inflammation. Again, that part is somewhat conjecture. But the important thing for Paul is that he didn't get let that get in the way at any time of his sharing of the gospel. And they had experienced, the Galatians had experienced such a powerful work of the Holy Spirit that they saw him working through Paul's weakness as he talks about in 2 Corinthians 12. He describes it like, when I'm weak, I'm strong because I'm yielded to the Lord. He's working through me. And those people saw it. They saw the Lord working through his weakness. In those days, he's saying as well, you would have done anything for me. 
It would even pluck out your own eyes. That's why, again, why they believe it was an eye condition. But each of us need to realize the same thing as well. And that is, we can't let our own personal weakness prevent us from allowing God to work through our lives, in and through our lives, and work in the lives of other people. As we share the gospel with other people, we can't think, well, I'm not qualified. He didn't ask you to be. He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. If he calls you to do something, he enables you to do it. And it's not on the basis of your strength. It's on the basis of his calling. He wouldn't call you to do it if he wasn't going to give you the ability to do it. And then he tells them in verse 16 to stay connected to the truth. As he says, have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now things have changed. The truth had not changed, but the Galatians had been influenced by the Judaizers who brought them into the philosophy of men. It's like today, the woke church is one that has brought in the philosophy of man and turned away from the truth of God's word. Now they saw Paul as an opponent because he wasn't going along with their wokeness. It's like, you're not in on the program. We're becoming more spiritual this way. And you're not recognizing it, Paul. So you're wrong. If you get mad at someone who tells you the truth of the Scripture, know where the real problem lies. It's not with the Scripture. And then... In verses 17 through 20, we get to the point then again as he tells them his ultimate desire here that Christ be formed in them. And in verse 17, that they first of all don't follow bad examples. As it says, they zealously court you, but not for good. Yes, they want to exclude you that you may be zealous for them. Paul is acknowledging that the Judaizers are giving the Galatians a lot of attention, but he's saying it's not for your good. When someone suddenly begins to do this, it's wise to ask yourself, why are they showing me so much attention? They wanted to get the Galatians into legalism so that they would elevate their own position. So they would say, look, I have all these Galatians following me, going along, we're following the law. You know, I have all of these followers sort of situation. There is a common practice among cults that's called love bombing. And what that is, is they give a person a lot of attention to hook them into following after them. It's like they'll go and do all kinds of things for them. And, and the important distinction is that when they do that, the objective is to get people following after them and not following after the Lord. That's the difference when the church does it. The church, we do things and point people to Jesus. A cult will do something and point you to them or to their leader. Romans chapter 10, verses 2 through 4 says, For we bear them witness, speaking about the zeal of the, uh, the Jews at the time, he says, For I bear them witness... <clears throat> 
that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, seek to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. So beware of any ministry that's preoccupied with itself and not Jesus. And then in verse 18, he tells them to be zealous for what is good. But it is good to be zealous in a good thing always and not only when I am present with you. Zeal is a good thing if it's directed towards the right object, to be enthusiastic about something. If you're zealous for good, your life will be pleasing to the Lord. The legalists were zealous about keeping the law. Zeal for a lie, then, like that, is dangerous because it brings a person into bondage. Paul wanted as well for the Galatians to be zealous for good at all times and not just when he was there. Now think about this. Again, his point is that Christ be formed in them. He didn't want them to just be doing the right things when he was there because that would demonstrate that they w didn't really have a relationship with the Lord or a mature relationship with the Lord and they weren't really walking with him because we weren't really walking with the Lord because when Paul leaves, they go back to their old lifestyle. But if you're walking with Jesus, if you're abiding in him, you see everything as being immediate with him and not through somebody else. And now in verses 19 through 20, he gets to the ultimate point here. He says, the point is that Christ be formed in you. As it reads... My little children, for whom I labor in birth until Christ is formed in you, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Paul was very literally the spiritual father of the Galatians because he came to them on his first missionary journey, which took place between A.D. 46 and 48. It was more like A.D. 48 when he finally got to them. He also likens himself to a mother giving birth. As he told the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7, but we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. But because of their backsliding in a sense, he felt like he had to give birth to him again. Which sounds silly, but that's what was taking place here. And, it, and he's saying to them, yes, it does sound silly. Why should I have to do this over again? He's viewing... The first time that he was there, if they really didn't come to faith in Christ, if they weren't, really weren't trusting in him, that his first time there was like a miscarriage. The reality of spiritual birth and true life is seen when Christ is being formed in an individual. when they're becoming more like Jesus. You see what happens here, and this is why Paul said earlier, to, they were, he exhorted them to imitate him, because you see what happens is, like for himself, he's saying, you know, I'm following Christ, 
you follow me, I'm allowing Christ to be formed in me. I'm letting it overflow to you. You allow Christ to be formed in you. It will then overflow to others. So that's the way we become witnesses. Like it says in John 7, 37 through 39, we, Jesus stood up in the temple and on the last day, the great day of the feast, and said, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me who drink and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart or his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And it goes on to describe that, that he said concerning the spirit whom those believing in him would, would, would receive. So it's that overflowing work of the Holy Spirit that takes place in our lives as Christ is formed in us. Then it's not work. It's lifestyle. It's not, oh man, it's not getting that. Again, this is the danger of that legalistic mindset is, oh, I have to go out to, and witness to so many people and, you know, as if we have to put a notch on a gun or, a, you know, check off on a checklist. But if Christ is formed in me, the love of Christ is compelling me. And then we'll see that naturally played out in our lives. The same can be true of the spiritual life of a church. That people, when they come in here, should experience the love and the life of Christ through his people, his body. Is their life the life of Christ among a gathering of believers. And we can ask ourselves, we need to ask ourselves personally, am I more like Christ today than I was last year? Is he being formed in me? Like it says in Romans 8, we know 28, for we know that all things work together for those who love God, for those who are the called according to his purpose. Then he gives further explanation in 29 where he says, for whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. So that's the work that he's doing. Whatever God's doing in your life, you know he can, he's doing it for that self-same purpose, that Christ be formed in you. And the point is, the question for each of us is, am I open to allowing him to do that? Am I open? Or, or am I trying to go back to those beggarly elements. Worrying about, as Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, what am I going to eat? What am I going to drink? What am I going to wear? Those things that the pagans worry about, he said. But seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added. Relationship. You see him just striving, or driving home again and again in the midst of this, even though he's going through this, these theological section here and describing biblically the justification by faith. He's not leaving out here the point, the central point in the midst of it. It comes through relationship. You enter in, you understand, you apply that through your relationship with Jesus. The only way that any of us can is to personally receive Jesus Christ as our Savior and then walk with him. Walk with him. 
grow in our knowledge of him. You know, be in his word. Be speaking with him through prayer. You know, walking with him daily, seeking his direction. Abiding in him. The purpose of God's working, again, is that the life of his son would be manifested in and through your life. That people would look at you and say, and see what God's doing in your life and seeing how God's using you and say, that, that's Jesus, man. That's certainly not them. I know them too well. It'll never happen by a religious practice, but only by an abiding relationship with Jesus. Please don't be satisfied with a cheap substitute for what God has for you in Christ. Know him. Walk with him. Love him. Experience the love, joy, and the peace that comes from knowing Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much again for your word. And the challenge we have here in this passage, Lord, to know you, to have your life formed in us, Lord, that we would be yielded to you uh, to do the work in our hearts that you desire to do, Father. And Lord, I just want to lift up as well, if there's anyone here who hasn't come into such a relationship with you, either because they haven't received you yet, they haven't repented of their sins and placed their faith in you alone for their salvation, or just simply they might be walking carnally and trying to have one foot in the kingdom of God and one in the world, just knowing that could never satisfy. So, Lord... Do a work in each of our hearts, we pray. Knowing how incredibly you love us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.